First of all, thanks for joining us today in our SSD 100 Offsec Live. Today, we're gonna to talk about why we should include security in our software development life cycle. So um, I'm gonna to try to keep this chill. Uh, I wanna tell you a thing or two about my experiences, things I've worked on and mistakes I've seen in the wild. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope you all have a great weekend. I'm really excited for the weekend. So let's start. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Jorge Moran. I, I live in Ecuador. There's my screen name. You, you'll probably uh, you see me around hanging on Offsex Discord. Uh, especially if you if you have uh, questions about SSD, I'll probably drop by the channel of of SSD. So first of all, I, I want to tell you a bit more about SSD. So the the idea of of having secure software development as one of the tracks that Offsec offers is that this is going to help developers it doesn't matter their their current experience level to polish their security skills ideally when when we learn to to program in it doesn't matter which language we are usually more focused on on you know creating value you know creating features fast but not too much focus is placed on how to harden our code in a way that uh, it prevents our software from being you know, attacked successfully. So that's the idea for today. Uh, first of all, I wanna start with good news. Okay, Offsec Live will launch for Web 200. Just as we had Offsec Live for uh, Pen 200, we're now starting it for Web 200. It's going to start on January 26th, and it's going to be until March the 23rd. Uh, it's going to be on Thursday from on Thursdays from 12 to 1:30 p.m. Eastern, and the instructors are going to be Victor and John. It's obviously going to be uh, a live session, but will be recorded, and you'll be able to access it via the LMS. And it's only gonna be available for registered students. So good news. So the plan for today, we're gonna discuss, you know, security requirements and the lack of security requirements in, in products that we create. And we're going to explore a few real applications, uh, their current security problems, and, and we'll analyze some ideas to improve them. That's the plan. So uh, a warning, uh, we will not attack applications today, not at all. We will not criticize the companies that created the websites that we're gonna explore. I mean, and every detail that we'll analyze today has not been found by attacking any, any website. Everything at most has been found by using the, the web developer tools of a browser. Also, no application was harmed during the making of this presentation. And of course, with great power comes great responsibility. So please do not attack any site without their explicit permission. So with that said, let's get into it. Now, first of all, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be just giving you facts for an hour. So I'll, I'll try to, to you know, post questions and so that we can discuss them, all right? So here's the first question I'm gonna ask you. Okay, what, what happens before we write code? Can, can anyone tell me? What usually happens before we write any code at all? What needs to happen? 
you know, we, we get we get a requirement from from a client or from our boss. Okay, so what do we do with that requirement? What's the first step? Design and planning, that's great. Hop EAX. We need to write specs, correct. So in in, in software engineering, we call the, the first step before design, because design is also a step, but it's further along the way. The first step is the analysis. That's correct. We gather the requirements, and that's part of the analysis. We gather the, the requirements. We we depending on the methodology we use, we might have some formats to that's correct. We we probably create some flow diagrams. Um we depending on the methodology, we, we might create like the the in the object interaction diagram, for example, or a simple a uh, plain old flow diagram for not using uh, IBM's RUP methodology. So in the analysis, we usually focus on, on business requirements, right? The, the deliverable. Oh, that's great. You're going to start advanced web attacks. That's awesome. Uh, I love that course. I, I was also a student of that course a few months ago before starting working on SSD, so it's great. So doing the, the analysis of the stage of our product uh, life cycle, we also need some threat modeling. Can, can anyone tell me what threat modeling is? Any ideas? So basically threat modeling is, is the activity in which we uh, Analyze, that's correct. Stride is one of the ways we can thread model. So the idea is to understand how our assets are gonna be vulnerable in some way. So that's when that's where thread modeling is useful. There are many ways to approach thread modeling. So we have, for example, attack trees, we have stride, we we have uh Linden, well, we have many ways to do this. So the idea here is to understand the risks that we have and how those risks uh, apply to our assets and how likely is that those risks materialize in some way. So we need to order them so that we, you know, place our focus on the risks that are more likely to, to become a reality. And this is where we need to place these two details in front of one another. So we have the use cases. You know, every use case is, is something like, when, when we're working on with, um, with agile methodologies with Scrum, we have uh, the equivalent of this is what we call user stories. So me as a user, you know, uh, I need to be able to access the platform using a set of credentials. Perfect, that's a use case. But let, let's think about how an attacker can use that use case in their advantage. So, one, one mistake that, that used to be common is that um, developers would be very explicit with their error messages. So for instance, um, nowadays it's common just to, to have a very vague message when, when a login fails. So you have, you know, like, Either username or password are incorrect, but in some cases, some very diligent uh, developers tell the user which of the values is wrong. So when you tell a user your password is incorrect, you are implicitly leaking that the username exists. So an attacker might leverage that 
to get an idea of which user exists. And, and that eventually could you know, evolve into a full blown uh, leak if, you know, if, if there are no other controls and, that prevent it. So that's an abuse case. You, you can have uh, a normal user flow, but that can be exploited in some way so that an attacker gets an advantage. That's an abuse case. Ideally, when we're in the analysis phase of our software project, we need to have a list of abuse cases linked to each of our use cases so that they can eventually become our security requirements. So the idea of security requirements is that we need to be able to have mitigations for each of the abuse cases. Those are security requirements. Now, sometimes the lack of security requirements are a calculated risk. And that's something that I'm not gonna criticize because every organization is different. So let me give you a few examples. Um, the, there used to be a, a newspaper here in my country that uh, has a website. The, 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 news, the newspaper still exists, but they, they started, you know, they released a feature that allowed users to get access to articles, you know, but only a few a month before needing a subscription. But here's the thing, just to create some sort of, you know, engagement, they would, present the article for a few seconds, and then via JavaScript, they would get redirected or a pop-up would appear telling them that, I need to, that they need to subscribe. But here's the thing, it was a very easily bypassable because you could just turn off JavaScript and then you would just, you could easily get access to the article. <laughs> um, so, the problem with that is that, I mean, it, it's a, it's very easy to just not present the article and just block the, the, the complete flow, right? But in some cases, it's a business decision to, to try to create engagement by giving them access for a few seconds and then just, you know, blocking the user. And uh, it's not something that uh, newspapers do. Any, any other content website that has some sort of paywall uh, sometimes has that feature that the, the content is available for a few seconds before, before uh, locking up the user. Also, some, some other security requirements achieve nothing. <laughs> and, uh, provide um, a false sense of uh, security. So for example, um, some banks here where I live have uh, disabled right click. Um, I, I don't know why, but they they usually don't allow users to, to right click maybe aiming, uh, maybe with the idea that they won't be able to access the uh, the web developer tools, but they don't know that we can also do that, you know, by by typing the the hotkey. So it achieves nothing. And well, here's the thing: we're creating the product, right? But we don't make the decision of what goes first and what gets done or not. So as developers, our job is to acknowledge the the problems that might arise from whatever it is we're creating and just relaying the message to our project manager, to our scrum master. And if they're informed, then ideally they'll, they'll make the, the right decision and help us with, you know, let us uh, add the mitigation in the current sprint or, or eventually, you know, define a, a security focused uh, sprint. And here's the, here's the thing though, security technical debt 
has a very high interest rate. Um, sometimes, you know, some some security fe some security features are are never taken care of, and that becomes a way bigger issue than if other features are not taken care of. Let, let's not go too far. Um, let's talk about the the, the Equifax uh, breach. The patch for the uh, framework that they were using, it was struts, it was already available. And unfortunately, they didn't prioritize, you know, patching that, that framework. And uh, the, the problem that it caused, uh, it was considerable. It, it was definitely uh, more expensive than, than just defining a, a sprint to, to patch that, that product. Again, business related features usually go first. So the only thing we can do as, as developers is, uh, you know, let the, the scrum master and the project manager uh, make informed decisions and do our jobs the best we can. Yeah, and, and that's what I was telling you. I mean, some security requirements have good intentions, but don't actually improve our security posture. We'll, we'll see some examples of that in, in a few minutes. Let's now um, start talking about the cases that we'll analyze today, all right? So we, we'll, we're gonna cover the, the first case has an information leakage, but before diving into the case, I wanna discuss something with you, all right? So the problem with how we identify our users. In the US, right, people are told to, to be very careful with their uh, social security number, right? Um, it's, it's considered a, a very sensitive piece of data. But here's the thing. Is it correct that so much power is placed upon a single piece of information, you know? Uh, I mean, you, you can open up credit cards with only with that value. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, right? Do, do we need maybe another way to complement that value so that it, it's not sufficient to have that to, to ruin someone's life? Uh, I don't know, because here's the thing, in Latin America, uh, those values are are almost public, right? We have uh, Documento Nacional de Identidad in some places. We have Cédula de Identidad in some other places, and those values are public. We don't we don't think twice about you know providing that value in in some websites. But here's the thing, we don't think twice because that's a unique value that identifies us, but. But what happens when the rest of our information can also be made public because of that value? That starts to become an issue. Let's see how. So we're we're gonna we're gonna start with with, with this website. Let me open it up here. Uh, can you can you see it? Yeah, there you go. Here it is. So this is a website of a basically a car dealership, okay? Uh, the, the idea of this website is to allow users to uh, create an appointment, a maintenance appointment, basically. So that's the functionality of the website. Now, let's talk about the problem. It provides too much information without authentication, okay? Let's see how. First of all, can you see this uh, clearly? Otherwise, let me just zoom it in, all right? Can you see it better now? So let's let's go to the to the other tab. So the, the first uh, step of this website is we need to provide our ID. Like I said, in, in, in my country, 
that ID is not as sensitive as uh, the social security number in, in the US, but it, it's still only a way to identify me, nothing more, nothing less. But in this case, with that value, that website also made public uh, information about my car. So this is a license plate, this value right here, the, the one that says Placa is a license plate. You know, the, this is the model of the car and this is the, the number of the chassis. Also, my email is here. So it shouldn't be possible for, for someone to, to get my email just with my ID, that that's not normal at all. So, uh, and this is not only a, a technical problem, right? Be, because here's the thing, uh, in, 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 in the EU, right? It also, I think in the US, it's starting to, to, to become more important, uh, like exactly PPI for free. <laughs> and, and there was no authentication, nothing. So in Europe, they, they started with, with GDPR, I think it was in 2017, that, that it started being, you know, like an actual risk for a company to, to do this, this sort of things. And in California, I think that they also have a, a similar law. But in some other countries, since there, there are no legal repercussions, well, companies don't care as much. And, and here's the thing. Um, I mean, I don't think that they have bad intentions at all, right? Because the the side was doing, they were just trying to, to reduce friction, right? They, they want people to convert. That, that's a marketing term. You know, you, you want conversions. You, you, you want people to, to do whatever it is they want to do as quickly as possible, right? The, the focus is on call to actions, on, on how we see it is for the user to complete the flow. But, I mean, by, by reducing friction, right, we, we didn't add any anything that would prevent a malicious user to farm data from here. But here's the thing, how, how comfortable would, would users be if they knew that this information was publicly available? I, I'm sure, they wouldn't be very happy about this. But since there are no legal consequences, well, well, they, they probably, uh, they probably just, you know, keep the status quo. But now we as developers, we want to try to do the right thing, right? So can you help me with ideas to, to improve the flow? And I, I'll, I'll take a look at the chat. Can anyone provide me a few ideas of what we could do if this were our side to, to improve it? Don't save data. Um, okay, uh, let's, uh, could you expand on that? What do you mean? Because here's the thing, you, you want I mean, the, that company wants clients to be able to, to make an appointment, right? So how do we not save data? L let, me, let me give you one idea, all right? We could probably just create a regular account with credentials, you know? It's probably, not going to be as frictionless as it initially was. Exactly. Identity and access management. That, that's a good way to, to start. Yeah, exactly. Authentication. You know, we could create an, a regular account with credentials. Um, uh, and I'll, if if it's not too much of an issue, you know, maybe we could even set up two-factor authentication, but serving 
you know, personally identifiable information without credentials is, is not a good idea in, in, in any situation. Okay, what, what if they don't want to, to do that, you know? At least, at least we could rate limit the initial query so that an attacker isn't able to farm, you know, the, the complete key space of identity numbers in a short amount of time. Because here's the thing, mm, I mean, 10 digits, because here in my country, uh, our ID numbers are only 10 digits. So uh, it's not uh, a too big of a number to, you know, form one by one. And even worse, if you because there, there's, an, there's an algorithm to, to generate those numbers. So it might be even easy for them to just use the algorithm to, to verify if uh, uh, an ID is valid before even querying the, the site. So, so at least we could make it more difficult. Now, can anyone give me an idea of another idea of how we could make it more difficult for an attacker to, to just start farming information, you know, besides rate limiting the, the query? Totally, yeah. We we could we could definitely achieve that with. That's correct. Yeah, we we could. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> let's go with the, with your ideas one by one, so that we can you know discuss them. With strict access control, we could definitely achieve you know a, a secure flow, but but. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the business, as they call them, maybe want to have some easier ways for users, you know, to, to be able to, to achieve their goals. So maybe it's a business decision that accounts are not a thing here. So rate limiting was one option, but Creating a captcha is also a very valid suggestion. So what 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 this do things achieve is that an attacker won't be able to farm information as easily. The, and, and that's a win here. I mean, information is public, but it's we're we're making it harder for attackers to extract our complete you know, database. Now let's uh Let's discuss the, uh, my Dr. Pepper's idea. Encrypted data at rest and in transit. So those are very good ideas. Now, here's the thing. How do those items relate to the problem we're trying to solve here? Because they're perfect, but here's the thing. The risk that those two things mitigate are different because Encrypting data at rest, uh, you know, what's the, what's the risk that, uh, you know, if we were tread modeling right now and, and we were uh, discussing uh, encrypting data at rest, what's the abuse case that we would have been discussing in, so that this is the solution? So the, just to give you an idea, because this is not the only case, right? But encrypting data at rest is, is a good measure if the problem that we wanna uh, that we wanna you know mitigate and control is that an attacker, after having gained access to our network, exfiltrates the contents of our drives. So if they're able to do that, if the data was encrypted at rest, and of course, if the key was not easily extractable too, then exactly, perfect. Then we, we go back to the CIA triad. So every control that we as developers add to our, uh, to our applications needs to be traceable to one of the CIA elements, right? Confidentiality, 
integrity and availability. Those are the, exactly, it's harder for, for the attacker to decrypt if we encrypt the data at rest. Let, let's talk about encrypting the, the data in transit because let, let's check the website again. It's already uh, running on HTTPS. So yeah, DLP is also a good control. Um, so look, uh, encryption in transit is already there. So it, it didn't, uh, it, it doesn't change much for this particular case. So let's continue with, uh, perfect, that we already discussed that we, we, we talk about the possibility of adding a capture. Now, in this case, a website tried to define a new way for users to authenticate. Um, you know, sometimes being innovative is great, but in some other cases, you know, innovative might not be the best idea. Uh, and let me give you an example. Well, one of the, one of the most famous uh, statements about cryptography is that it's always a bad idea to roll your own crypto. And why is that? Because, oh, oh why, why am I on Windows? Because I love uh, uh, WSL. Uh, I love it. It, it changed the, the experience completely. Just so you know, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's very comfortable. Uh, I use uh, uh, an Ubuntu, um, <laughs> an Ubuntu WSL instance, and I, I love it. Yeah, definitely, WSL is awesome. Okay, so I'm sorry. Let, let me go back to what we were. I I do I do have a, a Kali WSL as well, and I love it because from WSL you can actually uh, fire up a full blown we. With, with Kali, it's awesome. I love it. Yeah, Mac is not too bad, but I need x86, you know, applications. So that was an option, unfortunately. Well, anyway, well, <laughs> let, let's go back to our topic. So well, regarding encryption, it's, it's always a, a bad idea to, to roll our own crypto because although we might be, you know, math wizards, we, we don't have the scrutiny on our algorithm that already established, uh, you know, encryption methods already have, right? Uh, the, there are many, many, many cryptographers, you know, trying to punch holes on existing algorithms. So the ones that are commonly accepted are proven to be solid, <laughs> which might not be the case if we you know, fired up our own algorithm. You know, uh, this is also a thing with authentication. You know, uh, in, in the case of the website that we're gonna explore now, they uh, devised a way for users to authenticate, gain access to their account without actually having an account. Well, let's explore how. So here's the website. Well, let's, let's take a look at it for a bit. All right, so this is the website. The website is basically an electronics e-commerce store. They they sell computer parts, you know, electronics in general. So when you try to authenticate here, you don't have credentials. Uh, you have uh, you're only asked for your ID number, right? So what happens? Well, the functionality we were going to explore is the authentications for, for, for that e-commerce site. 
So let's explore the, the problems. The first one, again, it has information leakage. No, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna own it. <laughs> okay, let, let's, uh, let's explore this, this side, all right? Um, let me, can you, can you read it? Okay, so after you, you type your ID number, you're welcomed with the name of the person. Okay, not that bad, but also the email of the person, which, you know, shouldn't be public information. Here's the, uh, the API response of that. So again, um, we, we are also oh, falling victim of information leakage. And hey, Victor, welcome to the stream. Yeah, in, in Ecuador, a lot of car dealers have the, the same flow. <laughs> yeah, hi, hi, my Dr. Pepper. Yeah, my name is Jorge, Jorge Moran. Here it is, <laughs> here's my name. So, um, so that's the first problem uh, with, with this side, but it's not as bad as the other problem. Well, let's explore that one. So without being aware of, of the situation, um, users end up with a password that is easily crackable even though, I mean, they're, they supposedly don't have password. Well, let's see how that happens. So here's the thing. Let me just open up the image here so that I can, so that I can uh, move easily. There you go. So when you type the pin here, right? Oh, by the way, it's a four digit pin. So how many possible pins do, do we have here? Can I get some help from the audience here? If we have a four digit pin, how many possibilities do we have? Can I get any help from the audience here? So it's 10 to the fourth. No, there you go, Kate's kingdom. Yeah, thank you. 10,000, that's okay, that, that's correct. So if we have a four digit pin and the website needs to, needs to for us to authenticate, we only need to go through 10,000 uh, options until I mean, at worst, to find the one that was assigned to the user at random. That is the reason why ATMs lock you out after a few tries, because the space, you know, the, 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 the permutations of the password is a very, very small number. So, you know, brute forcing it is a very, very considerable risk. So here's the thing. Um, my email, the email I got, you know, I'm, I'm a bit blind. So I wasn't able to read uh, the, uh, the email easily. So I had to enter it a few times here. And let's, let's analyze uh, the, the first response. And, and, and let's uh, keep in mind the, the size of the of the response. You know, it's 1.15 kilobytes. So the response say that the status is failed. Perfect. So that means we 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 got the wrong pin. It says the the, the pin is invalid. That's the the translation of that. And if if we take a look at the browser console we can notice that uh, that same transferred amount of bytes repeats a few times. Now, what can we deduce from that? Can anyone tell me? So, 
So what we can deduce from that is that I entered a wrong password a few times. Exactly, I, I have a few failed attempts here. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six failed attempts. And unfortunately, uh, my account wasn't logged out. So th that is also the, the lack of uh, an important security requirement. As I mentioned, with, with ATMs, right? you have account logouts. So whenever, you know, if you were to, to try, you know, one too many times a wrong password, you would just get logged out of your account and you would need to either call or just go to the bank and ask them to unlock your account and probably reset your pin as well. But that didn't happen here. We were, I was able to, to keep trying and trying and trying and trying. And keeping in mind that the number of permutations really, really low, uh, that, that's correct, uh, violent press. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very convenient for an attacker to, to be able to, to brute force a pen without being logged out, you know, of course. Um, and, and that's something that, that it's not happening here. So let, let's, uh, let's check, um, let's check the, the, the successful login, right? After a few tries and, and you can actually, you know, you can actually see here that, uh, that I have the previous failed attempts in my, uh, my network history. But the successful, uh, you know, request is also here. So look, the pin is valid, perfect. And I was provided with a JSON web token, perfect, the IP from which I, uh, I logged in and a lot of information that is not strictly required for me to continue. Just so you know, a it, it, funny fact here. Uh, one of the, so for some reason, th this website links uh, salespeople to clients so that whenever a specific client makes a purchase, you know, some salesperson uh, gets uh, rewarded for that. And uh, I know who that person is for me. And, and the question is, should I know that information? Uh, I'm not sure that's up to them, but sometimes, and that's also something I wanna, I wanna highlight here. Um, when we're creating our APIs, uh, we, we, need to, we need to make sure who the clients of uh, 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 those API, APIs is, is going to be, right? What system is going to consume them? Because if uh, it, I mean, that same API might be used internally for some other reason, but by the time it's also used as, as a publicly accessible endpoint, you might be leaking internal information. So it's important to, to, to notice that, right? You know, as developers, we, we should know that and place controls so that it doesn't happen. Now, oh, let, let's check the, the chat here for a minute. Yeah, and what, what Victor mentions is also true. And it also depends on, on the legislation of, of of each country, right? Because in some places, companies are, are not allowed to, to have information that they, they didn't acquire lawfully. But unfortunately, in some places, it, it doesn't matter where you got the information, you, you are free to, to use it. <laughs> if you get a hold of it, of course. So let's uh, uh, 
let, let's talk about the, the implications of the of this case, right? There, there's no rate limiting, so we could easily brute force the endpoint with ID numbers to extract valid email addresses. Again, in, in my country, you, you have many, many, many companies where, where this is possible. So um, no rate limiting for the authentication to me is even more important than the first problem because uh, we only have to guess one in a very low number, 10,000, to be able to impersonate a user, which, you know, which is not a good thing. And another thing I didn't mention, the, that pin keeps being valid, so it effectively becomes the user's password from then on until they generate a new one. So for, from the browser uh, developer console, you're able to right click uh, a request and then just copy it as a curl command. So I copied it, the, the one that contains the, the, the successful authentication. And I've been running it you know, every few days to see if, if the pin expires in some way and it doesn't, it keeps being valid. So from now on, that pin became my password, unfortunately. So, any ideas on how we could fix this? What do you think, guys? How could we fix this? OK, so let, let's go back to the implications. For, for the first <laughs> stack overflow. Yeah, the, the first uh, the first implication will give us an idea of what we could do to mitigate it. So since there's no rate limiting and we could just brute force the, the first endpoint with ID numbers, it might be a good idea to, to rate limit it. I don't know, maybe 10 requests per day per IP or something like that. So that uh, no one's able to, to extract uh, too much information. Again, ideally, uh, we should allow uh, attackers to extract nothing, but if if that flow is mandatory for some reason, then at least we're making it more difficult for attackers. I mean, in in, in my opinion, uh, th there's no reason for for any side to not have a regular, you know, user password type uh, flow of authentication. And of course, even, even if multi-factor authentication is, is an option, then ideally that too. Now, I'm not gonna enter that, that controversy regarding uh, if uh, SMS-based uh, two-factor authentication is good or bad, because depending on our threat model, it might be or it might not be, right? Uh, so again, to me, in, in, in my opinion, any layer of security is better than not having it at all. So at least if you know if if having SMS authentication is an option, you know, at least SMSs are are another thing that attackers need to crack before getting to an account. So that's always a good thing. Now, rate limiting for for the first endpoint is Okay, it, it's something that needs to be controlled. But I think the, the most important issue here is how easy it was to impersonate another user. So definitely uh, a CAPTCHA there wouldn't have heard, you know. But anyway, that's the end of case two. So we're running out of time. So let me go to case number three, all right? So uh, the, the thing with usable security is that um, security is sometimes seen as an anti-feature, right? Because the, the feature of an e-commerce site is, you know, the authentication is not the most important part. The, the important part is to be able to buy something, right? The conversions. So at least 
you know, because security is supposed to be a hurdle in, in some way. So at least it should be comfortable for users to use it. So usable security needs to be a thing. Now let's explore a website. This, this, uh, this is a, a government agency here where I live. And uh, let, let me just uh, show it to you for a minute. So the thing here is that in their way of seeing the threat models of, of this platform, they considered that uh, we're all currently victims of being uh, affected by a keylogger in our system. So they only allow you to type with your keyboard on the username, but for the password, they have an on-screen keyboard. And you can only type here. I don't know if you can if you can see it. But it doesn't end there. Uh, you, as you can see, this looks like a QWERTY layout, but it's not. It's completely shuffled. So besides you know having to type on your password uncomfortably on that on-suite keyboard, it's shuffled. Yes, yes, that shoulder surfing is a possibility. But here's the thing, it doesn't end there. It gets shuffled around every time you open it up. So, okay, shoulder surfing is a valid concern, but you need to know your audience. This website, the, the main target of, of this website is people who are soon to retire or are already pensioners. People that, you know, are usually not that technologically literate. So it making it more difficult for them to type their credentials is gonna probably going to make them, you know, have very weak passwords. Also uh, to make things worse here, uh, the, the way the, the site is coded also breaks uh, password managers. So if you try to use a password manager, they don't work. No, because they, they intercept keystrokes here. So you can't type anything or just control V. I mean, what you could do though is use, you could just open up the uh, developer tools and, uh, you know, uh, use JavaScript to type something in here, but that's even more tedious than using the on-screen keyword. So, so yeah, the, that that uh, that's the the final example I wanted to show you. So, uh, the the idea is that we as developers we need to yeah we need to be efficient with our business goals, but we don't need to neglect the the side to, types of things we've explored today so that our deliverables are not only usable and functional, but also secure. And, and, and that's very important. Yeah, I mean, ideally we, we wanna make, uh, make it easy for users to, to log in. So uh, I'm sorry, we are almost out of time, but does, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, ideally, you know, uh, secure software development, it's not secure coding because we're not just talking about uh, you know, the, the coding part, but also the requirements, how we approach, you know, the, the life cycle. Um, I don't teach uh, courses, but I'm a content developer. Uh, I, I write the content for SSD. And I'm also, uh, you know, on Discord a lot. So don't be shy and say hi. Uh, my, my handle is zero uh, X jams. So um, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, it's been great uh, 
spending this uh, this hour with you. Yeah, that that's that's who I am. Zero X Gems. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great weekend. Uh, thanks for being with me during this session. Uh, have a good one. Cheers.